in the beginning. I always want to start off that way. Um, before there were streamers, uh, before there were videos of games, we got our news of what games to play through monthly magazines. And one of, the, one of those magazines was PC Gamer. Um, I owe a personal debt of gratitude to PC Gamer. If PC Gamer had not um, published a letter to the editor from Stephen Kick, um, he would not have gone on to found Night Dive Studios, and I would have had to find a real job. Um, but, uh, but that said, in, in the beginning, there was, there was the magazine. And as, as time has gone on, we've got more and more ways of, of consuming content about what games we should play, um, letting us know what the game's play looks like and, and all of that glitz. And that's great. And there's, there's a place for that. But there are still real serious topics that need to be debated in our industry. Um, some that come to mind are how our industry copes with crunch. Um, what do we do about toxic communities? And those kinds of issues are not being handled by streamers. Oh, they may be alluded to and, and they may make reference to them, but if you really want to talk about solutions, if you want to do an in-depth examination, you still have to turn to real journalists. There is a, a need and um, a relationship between journalists and people that, that make and consume games. And that relationship is, is important. It's as important now as it, as it ever was. Um, and so, with that in mind, we have invited somebody that's going to speak about the importance of journalism to come visit with us. Evan, you're up. All right. Thanks to Larry for that warm introduction um, and validation of my profession. Is this close enough? Is that good? All right, cool. Just let me know. Thank you. Oh, yeah. So, yeah, thanks, Larry. Thanks to the IGDA for having me here. Really glad to be here with the guys. Uh, a few weeks removed from E3, fully restored. Uh, really happy to be sharing a little bit of perspective about the gaming media and the relationship to the development community and the larger industry. Um, I can't really think of a time that this sort of exchange has happened. Um, it seems like a lot of the discussion about the gaming media happens on Twitter. Uh, where, in my opinion, it's, it's not as productive as it could be. So happy to be able to share my perspective. You know, hopefully you're going to walk away with this with something of value, regardless of kind of the relationship with the media, regardless of whether you're actually dealing with us, with us on a daily basis via email or otherwise. So let's dig into it. <clears throat> so I'm Evan Lottie, Editor-in-Chief, Global Editor-in-Chief at PC Gamer. Uh, I've been doing this somehow my entire adult life, writing about games. And my job at PC Gamer is basically to shape our strategy, to cultivate a great stable of writers who can cover news, can report what's happening, can produce great features, uh, can produce great reviews, and to really lift them up to do their best work. Um, so within that, I'm also deciding what stories appear on PC Gamer and the ones that don't. I'm deciding how we frame those stories that do, we do publish, so what headlines they have, how they're posted on social media, what images do we like, all that kind of stuff. And ultimately, I'm just trying to figure out how we get the maximum amount of people on our website and engage in what we're producing. Um, <clears throat> I'm also one of the creators of the PC Gaming Show at E3. It's fresh in my mind from last month. Uh, if you're not familiar with the PC Gaming Show, it's the de facto um, press conference for PC Gaming and showcase. And I wanted to mention it here because Year-round, we're always looking for developers to, to bring and showcase their games at the PC Gaming Show, big and small. So if you happen to be working on a PC game that's unannounced and you think that E3 is a good showcase, we'd be happy to hear from you. Um, we, we take that responsibility as curators for the platform really seriously, so and we're, we're always looking for uh, new games to, to showcase. <clears throat> uh, and just finally, my, my own gaming background, I'm a big competitive FPS player. I love Counter-Strike and Team Fortress 2. Rainbow Six, uh, the games I've played this year, this year the most are probably um, Apex Legends and Slay the Spire. So in this talk, really quickly, I'm hoping that we'll be able to cover um, a few basic topics. It's not going to be comprehensive, of course, about gaming media. That would be far too much for you guys. But um, I want to dig into a little bit of just what we do from a basic level in 2019, what the gaming press produces in basic terms. Um, but then the, the business model 
and that its relationship to what we make. And my hope is that like by understanding kind of these basic fundamentals, you'll understand how to reach us better and kind of our needs and the need, needs of our audience and how to equip us with really good information, really good assets that allow us to produce really interesting stories about your games. <clears throat> I also want to spend some time digging into what I, what I consider to be the best practices around how to interact with the media. Um, there's no kind of guidebook out there, especially if you're an independent developer or you don't have PR. Uh, how do I work with these folks? How do I reach out to them? How much do I email them? There's a lot of uh, stuff to learn there, I think. Um, and along with that, I think kind of relating that whole package is just what do we look for in stories? What makes a good story? How do we make that determination? Um, how do we chase audience factors into everything here? And certainly I'm, I'm really interested in what you guys are individually curious about. Um, so please like be thinking about what questions you can bring to the end of this discussion. I, I really want to tap into your own uh, interest around this topic. <clears throat> So I don't want to bury the lead. The, the big takeaway I want you to walk away from this talk with is that the gaming press is not a monolithic entity. I think um, some of the net negative rhetoric that we encounter tends to be this kind of description of the gaming press as an entire, you know, as if we, we fit into one box together. In actuality, you know, we're a set of publications that have risen out of a lot of different places. And, um, you know, acknowledging that, I think, is a really important step in understanding how to work with us individually, that we have different focuses and different needs um, and different ways of producing even the same stories. Um, <clears throat> because, you know, on, on the surface, if you're, if you're visiting the homepages of IGN and GameSpot and, and my website and uh, Eurogamer, and you're, you're looking at that top navigation panel and you're saying, well, they all, they all kind of produce reviews, they produce previews, they produce news and features. Um, but the way that we get to those stories is really different and the makeup of our staffs, you know, the emphasis on video, as I'm sort of describing in this slide, um, the emphasis that we place on using Google as a, as a way to leverage and gain audience uh, differs significantly between different outlets. And that extends all the way to our business model. So not every website is equally dependent or reliant on advertisement, which has a huge impact on the types of stories that we pursue and how we, we frame them, right? Likewise, we've got, um, you know, it's a huge trend across all of, you know, entertainment and different services right now, subscription services, the gaming media is, is exempt from that trend. Um, we have a lot of exciting independent creators doing great work on Patreon and finding like small, really passionate audiences there. Um, but we also have outlets like mine and IGN and others that are running these premium membership programs as a way to sort of build our audience and our, and our sort of core nucleus of hyper-passionate fans. So hopefully by acknowledging these differences, you can start to understand how to deal with this individually and understand that like, okay, approaching PC Gamer is different than approaching Eurogamer because they're concerned with different things or they present stories differently. <clears throat> so let's try and take inventory of what the game press does in 2019, because it's changed a lot over time. Um, from my perspective, and again, in, in that tone of, of not being, the game press not being a monolithic entity, I can't speak for everybody, and I think a lot of my colleagues would find some differences here. But for me, we inform, entertain, we operate as a watchdog, and we curate. Um, those are kind of the four pillars of, you know, what I wake up, or, up every day trying to empower my staff to do. Um, but the bigger takeaway is that the stuff listed on the slide is almost entirely influenced by our audience and what they want. Um, I'll be talking about this a lot and how audience drives what we produce more than our own clever ideas. Um, fundamentally, <clears throat> fundamentally, we go where audiences are. Um, you know, I, I didn't make this part of the presentation, but reviews are a huge example of this right now. So you think about the, the growth of early access programs, open betas, pre-alphas. <clears throat> the whole meaning of a gaming review has really been called into question over the past few years, really since like Minecraft popularized, um, you know, the game isn't finished yet, but you can play it for multiple years, right? So even with, like, with that example, right, when do you review a game? Do you review it when the developer says it's done? Do you review it when it's purchasable? Um, and then, like, if you decide to wait until that final moment, say it's been out for multiple years, what's, what's the purpose of a review at that point when people have been playing it, streaming it, talking to their friends about it? Is it a formality? So that's just kind of one example, right, of um, 
how platforms and how audiences and how the structure of the industry and how we sell games influences significantly my business and, and how we present information. <clears throat> um, really quickly too, guides are another big example of this topic. Um, I'm curious how many of you have at one time owned or read a printed Prima guide that you maybe wandered in it. Wow, that's a lot, terrific. Uh, you, maybe you wandered into GameStop or like EB Games or whatever the precursors were, and, and, you, and you picked that you know like two pound manual up for me. It's Final Fantasy Tactics. Um, you know, Prima Games closed in 2018, but um, it, it's interesting because it, it, it didn't close because there's a lower interest in guides. In fact, it's it's one of the biggest growing categories within my business. Um, and that's partly because we've seen the rise of these so-called skyscraper games. So this is how I'm gonna be describing them throughout the talk. When I say skyscraper game, I mean Apex Legends, Overwatch, World of Warcraft, games that are have huge lifespans that are update, updated continuously, constantly changing, right? Um, so the prevalence of those games means that you know there's this huge demand for like constantly updated information in, in these guides that we're building and it represents a huge um just stockade of our focus uh, across me and, our, and my competitors so just as, as one simple example you know the apex legends apex legends uh, season two update went live today rock paper shotgun who's, who's one of the leaders i think in, in producing great co guide coverage today they have 54 indiv individual articles about apex legends so and these are guides, just guides, that they're updating continuously, telling people how to operate specific weapons in the game, you know, how to get the most out of certain characters, how to move, understanding the gear system. It's extraordinarily granular. And this is not something that existed in online gaming media even six or seven years ago. And it's representative, again, of the change in behavior of the audience, the change in, the change in the type of games that we're receiving and that are popular, right? The whole existence of games as a service and, and these skyscraper games that are extending for sometimes five plus years of lifespan. Um, so that's just another quick example of how what we produce is influenced by the type of games that exist in the world, of course, and how it's changing constantly. So in the spirit of that, in this section, I wanna dig into a little bit um, my understanding of how information used to flow in the gaming industry and how it flows now between the press and the rest of the industry. So back in the 90s, when I was a reader and not a writer of, of this content, um, it was a pretty straightforward process. We have the industry, we have developers, publishers, and PR, people who have, have a handle on the information assets uh, that are being produced. And the media is sitting cleanly in the middle, you know, effectively operating a monopoly on this information because we're the ones that have the publication platforms. We have magazines, we have websites, um, we have those mechanisms. You know, in this period, game developers didn't have YouTube channels, they didn't have Twitter accounts, they didn't have a means of more or less directly reaching their fans and their audience, right? Apart from, say, like commercials or advertisements, if you can cons consider that direct. Um, and really, it's only in the time of like the aggregators that rise up in the era of like dig.com, if, if you use that website as, again, that's like a precursor to Reddit, um, that we start to see other forces within internet media insert themselves and really disrupt and change things fundamentally for everybody, not just me. So today, it's, it's a very different and, and complicated situation where platforms sit at the center. And most of the information flows through some type of platform, right? Um, if you want to reach an audience, how do you do it, right? You, you have to create a Twitter account, create a YouTube channel, create a Steam page, uh, create a, a subreddit or find your existing subreddit and develop a relationship with them. And absolutely, like developers have their own platforms, right? You have official forms that you create. Um, you have official web pages that you operate that you have total control over compared to something algorithmically driven. Um, but nevertheless, platforms has, have a huge amount of influence and power, not over what we do and where we find information, but where you guys find audience as well. So we're all operating within the same system. But more importantly, everyone is a publisher within that system. So the audience is a publisher. You're a publisher, right? We're not in the world that I just showed before where the media is essentially the only entity that can 
say things, put them out in the world, and have them be heard, right? Um, so you've got that ability to speak directly to the audience, more or less. You know, yes, you're operating within uh, the fickle algorithms of, of, just as we are, of Facebook and other platforms. Um, but it's a fundamental shift in just the way things operate that's worth noticing. You know, it, it feels like it's always been this way, but I'm, I'm lucky enough to have spent enough time at PC Gamer to remember a time when this wasn't the case and it was you know, very one directional. <clears throat> so in sum, in comparing how things used to be to how things are today, um, previously devs could not directly communicate with their audience. They didn't really have a, a clean mechanism for doing so. The press was a filter for that information. Today, information flows in all directions. You know, and it, it's worth saying, too, that to some extent, I consider developers a competitor within that space. You know, developers in, in the 90s and the early 2000s, they would, they would give us something called an exclusive. <laughs> you know, and, and they would approach us and say, hey, if you give us X number of magazine pages, we'll give you the first reveal on Diablo 3, right? How exciting. Now, you know, these developers have a variety of choice of how to roll out that information. They can pay within platforms to amplify that information on Facebook. So they have a lot of dials that they can tune in. They have access to the same tools and analytics that we do. So things have, have really changed competitively, right? Um, again, platforms have, to, have a ton of power sitting at the center, essentially operating as a nexus for all that information and where it flows. They have a lot of influence, you know, if if you've operated a Facebook page for a game, if you've had any kind of relationship, or perhaps you've developed a mobile game, you're probably deeply familiar with the impact that Facebook's changing ideas about how it does its business can have on a development studio, let alone a media team. <clears throat> I think it's worth noting out too today that unlike you know, five, six, 10 years ago, the audience is a source of stories and articles. I'm going to be digging into this in greater detail later in the talk, but that simply wasn't the case. You know, we weren't looking to the communities to tell us kind of to speak the truth of what's happening in those games. Uh, but again, linking back to those skyscraper games, there's sort of, you know, and, and again, the power that platforms have, it, it's so interesting that we're in a world where developers, instead of owning and operating their own forums, as sort of their primarily, primary area where community discussion takes place. A lot of studios, including like Respawn, for example, and EA with Apex Legends, they've gone all in and just accepted that you know, our community is going to end up on Reddit anyway. We may as well just try and influence it and kind of participate there and make it a part of it. But by doing so, they're giving up so much control in the process, right, in terms of how the narrative is shaped, how things are moderated. I just think it's fascinating that we're, we're in that space where the community itself has these publication platforms that truly shape the narratives that we assign to these games, whether a game is succeeding or doing well, can depend on the whims of individual players and kind of what messages they latch onto. I think it's just an interesting time for us to be in. <clears throat> I think we also, it's also worth noting how fragmented audiences are. Again, in the nature of subreddits, right, you have individual communities of hundreds of thousands or millions of followers just for specific games. Um, and that extends to my realm where we have hyper-specialized content creators who spend years focusing on a single game, okay, and getting better at that game and sharing that content with their audience. So that creates kind of an environment where we become generalists. In other words, we cover the wide swath of what's happening in gaming, and, and that's kind of our competitive offering against these, this you know, almost infinite pool of hyper-specialists who are all in on individual games, individual genres, and individual styles of content. But you know, I think the good news from my perspective is because everyone's a publisher, the total volume of information kind of within the system of social media, Reddit, and elsewhere is much higher. And, and as media, we benefit when there's more discussion, more things happening, more opinions circulating. <clears throat> so with that said, I think it's worth um, considering a few of the challenges that the media face today and kind of uh, digging into that. I've already talked about specialists versus generalists. Um, platform volatility, this is another way of echoing the, the algorithms um, and, and kind of ever-shifting rugs underneath our feet when we're on Facebook. Um, just speaking on behalf of PC Gamer, 
in June 2016, which is not that long ago when you think about it, a third of our visits came from Facebook during the month of E3, right? Last month during the month of E3, a tenth. And it's not as if like we've lost our sense of how to do Facebook. You know, it, it's purely Facebook changing the rules, changing the kind of background mathematics that are driving how our stories are surfaced and how we can compete there. So certainly like if you were a game developer, but in particular a, a member of the media who went all in on Facebook in 2012 and 2013, when all the signs were pointing to this being the, the future of information and how people are getting information, you, you saw a massive change, you know, and, and it, it just speaks to the, the kind of the difficulty of, as media, we, we're challenged to control our own destiny. But we also have to take advantage of these platforms. And that's a, there's a really interesting tug of war between those two things. Um, a couple more that I'll rattle off here. It's really competitive. Anybody can be a publisher. Of course, it's competitive um, in, in the age of Twitch and YouTube. Um, hey, there's global distrust of the media. I don't know if you guys have caught on uh, following perhaps the political atmosphere over the past couple of years. We're definitely recipients of that too. You know, there's, there's kind of no exception there. Um, ad blocking, people are frustrated by ads, goes without saying. So, you know, you, you pile that up and it, and it looks really scary for, for the gaming media. Gosh, like there's all this competition and oh, you have to be on Facebook, you don't really control Facebook, you have to pay money to promote your stories. How does that work? But from, from where, I'm, where I'm standing, and again, I'm not the uh, arbiter of the games media by any means. <clears throat> I'm just one voice. Our audiences, our audiences are bigger than ever. Yes, platforms are subject to volatility, but they're also incredibly powerful. They let us access new people, access new demographics entirely. Instagram, go to IGN's Instagram, see what they're doing there. It's, it's really interesting. Um, there's much more to talk about. There's much more information circulating within the system, as I said. And um, we have really powerful tools of our own to guide our coverage. That wasn't the case eight or nine or 10 years ago. You know, we use Google Analytics, we use a lot of tools that allow us to see what people are searching for around games on Google. And that allows us to essentially make incredibly safe bets because we know that 40,000 people a month are wondering what the best gun in Apex Legends is. So, well, of course we're gonna spend X amount of money commissioning that story. It's a no brainer. So that's a really, really useful tool for us. Um, the existence of specialists just kind of reinforces our role. Uh, as Larry was saying in his kind introduction, you know, like as much as there are some really exciting voices on YouTube and, and elsewhere doing great reporting style coverage and digging into these issues that the community cares about, um, I think ultimately a lot of that conversation has sat with us and will continue to in terms of being a watchdog and holding the industry accountable. I'm not sure who else is gonna do that if not us. Um, and finally, just our revenue is actually like way more diverse than it was when I started at PC Gamer 10, 10 or 11 years ago. Um, E-commerce is a big reason for that. Uh, we spent a lot of our time building and editing stories around the best gaming laptops, best gaming keyboards, and like an infinite number of categories there um, that are, are as granular as you like them to be. And we earn through affiliate revenue from Amazon and other websites, Walmart, Best Buy, Newegg. Um, so that's really something that we can take advantage of and it makes us less re reliant on ads, makes us less reliant on other uh, types of financing, which is great. So let's talk about where people are reading today. I've kind of referenced this, but I'm hoping to give you some, some raw numbers here. Again, gaming media not being a monolithic entity, but I think I can generalize pretty safely about this and say that most websites of, of our kind, they're getting greater than half of their audience through search. And by search, I'm saying Google. I'm also saying YouTube as the world's second largest search engine for a number of years now. Um, so that has a number of implications, right, um, that I'd like to break out really quickly. So if you want to know what your community cares about and you're involved or you're, just, you're playing a popular game, it's a really fun experiment to just go in in that moment and check out the Google autocomplete. It sounds like the most pedestrian thing you can do but you're effectively taking the pulse of what the volume of searches in your, in your territory are for that game. For Apex Legends, which just launched season two today, um, of course, people are wondering about season two, they're wondering about when it's coming out, wondering about the details around that, makes sense. Um, but for us, this is an incredibly useful tool. At any time, we have a window into what gamers care about for a particular topic. So, 
effectively the the uh, the Google search results become this like eyeball battleground <laughs> for 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 this real estate, right? So think about it as like an, an Olympic podium. You know, you're you're gonna you're gonna get a gold medal for being the top result on Google. Um, second and third is still pretty good, but after that, like there's there's kind of not a lot of return there. So m me and my competitors, like we're we're effectively round the clock competing for the highest value search terms around gaming. So best games 2019. I can tell you that's an incredibly valuable search term that we're weekly refreshing in order to send signals to Google that, hey, we have the most up-to-date, relevant content. You know, we're using keywords. We're doing what's called search engine optimization of our articles in order to signal, send really strong signal, signals to Google that we have great content. Other people are linking to it. We're linking to it. Um, but it's, it's basically a, a really complex, <laughs> never-ending game that we have to play to compete within this ecosystem that did not exist at all 10, 12 years ago, right? So huge, huge landscape shift in the way we operate, in the way we figure out what to write about. We're not going to you guys and saying, what does your community care about? I mean, of course we are, like when we interview you. But more often on a daily basis, we can just look ourselves. Like we can operate independently, and that has a lot of implications in terms of the relationship between the media and developers. This is just a, an, another visualized example of that. You know, that search behavior is going to drive action. If you're curious about it, you know, find one of these popular guide terms. You know, look up uh, Destiny 2 guides or you know, Rocket League, any of these like popular competitive skyscraper games, and you're going to see about 50 different websites trying to do the same thing duking it out on Google, and you're going to see them changing position month over month. It's really interesting. All right, so back to where gamers are re reading. You know, the rest of the, the makeup here is, is pretty flexible. It this is where it really depends on the outlet, depends on kind of how much they've invested in social, how good they are at social. Um, it depends on sort of, and when I say direct traffic, so direct traffic is people literally typing in your, your URL and ending up on your website, right? Um, that's going to be reliant on kind of how strong of a fan base you've built up, how, how big is your legacy, how big is your reputation, how enjoyable is your site to read. Um, so again, we've got like very different approaches here between websites, you know, folks that are doubling down completely on Google and sort of trying to pick up that massive transient audience. And maybe they're not as concerned with like developing return readers and, and fans. Uh, and then we have websites like Polygon, um, who else? I mean, um, PC Games N is one of our big competitors, Rock, Paper, Shotgun. You know, folks that are really, they have SEO specialists as part of their organization. They spend all day, every day thinking about how to, if I'm, if I'm being cynical, manipulate, but, but really just win on Google and get the most out of that. Um, okay. <clears throat> so I want... You know, again, in talking about the different outlets, um, this is just sort of hand, a handful I've selected. I wanted to highlight what I see as some of the specializations between outlets. And again, the hope here is that we can identify, you know, by familiarizing ourselves with the differences between these different outlets, we can acknowledge that, like, oh, right, they have different needs. Like, a press release sent out to everybody isn't going to have the same impact. You know, it's going to depend on how it's written. It's going to depend on the assets that we package in it. And sort of thinking strategically about Okay, what do the most number of sites care about, or like, what genre or theme am I operating in, and does that appeal to this group of sites or that group of sites? It's it's a really deliberate decision you have to make, rather than thinking, again, you know, monochromatically, I guess, about um, the spectrum of outlets that are out there. So with IGN, they're incredibly focused on video. We have one of the biggest video teams um, in the industry. They ha even have dedicated video shows that they're refreshing constantly. Um, they have user-generated wikis. Compare that to something like Giant Bomb, which is a really interesting contrast, but like just as admirable, right? Like they certainly have like a smaller audience if, if you're just looking at raw numbers in, in terms of popular websites on the internet. But they've figured this amazing thing out where they've been able to support themselves almost exclusively through th subscription-based content and like the power of their personalities, right? Like. They're able to be themselves and get an audience through that, which is amazing. Like these guys aren't worried about Google at all. They're just producing fun, interesting, you know, hu humorous um, content, which is really cool. 
Uh, VG247 is an example of a website that's like completely doubled down on guys and news in 2019. But they're part of this larger network, um, this larger company that's uh, that also owns Game Industry, that owns Rock Paper Shotgun, that owns Eurogamer. Um, they operate PAX, they operate Res. So th it's this really interesting conglomerate that you know they have to distinguish themselves from each other, which is worth noting, in order to avoid cannibalizing each other. So that's kind of an interesting part of the landscape. Most of those sites are based in Europe. Um, uh, otherwise, you know, Vice's cultural reporting and, and the kind of their, their specific eye for stories stands out, and Kotaku stands out for their you know, excellent investigator reporting. I'm sure it's crossed your guys' uh, computer screens and phones in the past year, some amazing stuff out of them. Uh, but it's an interesting contrast with Kotaku because they're also one of the few remaining like true blogs in, in terms of their presentation. And I would say they're less focused on search and SEO and more focused on building up video right now. So again, you've got like very different trajectories. Um, and, and knowing this, you know, one of the things that I, I tell to anybody who's, who's interviewing at, at PC Gamer is like, take the time to understand our specific needs, understand like our holes, what we need, what we're, what we're not great at, uh, what, we're, what we're great at, you know. Um, I think the same thinking applies here when you're, when you're approaching a journalist or you're trying to get your game covered you have to demonstrate an understanding for not only that publication, but ideally the writer in particular, like targeting the specific person who cares about your genre or your franchise, right? You're gonna have greater success if you're able to find that person. Like I'm really passionate about competitive multiplayer FPS and like the resurgence of arena FPS and like neo retro FPSs, you know, and, and like if you just click on my byline, you're gonna, you're gonna see that told out. Um, so, that kind of legwork is really going to help you stand out among like the pile of press releases that we get every day that are like very shotguns to every member of the media. I just want to pick out a couple stories here too to, to more specifically demonstrate the, the spectrum of good stuff that's happening because again, in this theme of comparing the past when I was a reader or when I was just beginning at PC Gamer in 2008 to the kind of coverage that exists now, I think that anybody who's saying that games journalism is dead is not reading this stuff somehow or they're, or they're not acknowledging it. Um, you know, this story here, this is our site, uh, the life and death of Eve Online's first all-woman pirate gang. Um, first of all, it's just a testament to Eve Online and its longevity and how interesting that game is. Um, but it's not as if like the developers of Eve Online approached us and say, said like, hey, have you heard about our latest feature, this like all-woman pirate gang who's roaming through our, <laughs> our like community-driven, you know, multiplayer space game? Um, so, you know, at one end of the spectrum, we have those like really interesting community-driven stories that I think didn't exist when I was first coming into the industry. And then you have this terrific, um, just essential reporting uh, from folks like Cecilia at Kotaku and Jason at Kotaku. You know, hopefully you guys have had a chance to read this story about the, the culture of sexism at Riot Games and the kind of continuing coverage of crunch that Jason's provided, um, having tremendous impact, I think, and really, um, starting to move things in, in a good direction and developing a good conversation around this stuff. Uh, elsewhere, just a couple things to highlight, right? We've got <clears throat> IGN's writing about mortality. This is last week. I think that's wonderful. <laughs> One of the biggest gaming websites in the world is talking about a personal relationship with death that the writer has with games. That wasn't happening when I came into the industry. And we got Vice holding Steam accountable, right? Um, so. So again, like, you know, I accept that the folks that are most critical about gaming journalism or the state of the, the media in general, um, maybe they're not finding this stuff, but it's out there and, and we're spending a lot of time and resource and, and care to produce it. Okay, so now that we've kind of established just the state of things generally from my perspective, let's talk about us, you know. Uh, let, let's talk about your relationship with the gaming press. Um, there's a lot to say just about the process of navigating, whether you're actually giving interviews at some point in your career, or you're interacting via email, or you're just kind of like passively interacting with the gaming press and comment threads or on Twitter. Um, but the analogy that I like, and it's one that um, someone at Sega gave me many years ago, is that you, know, you don't want to put anything in the well that you don't want to pull out later. Um, you don't want to piss in the well, right? Because the gaming industry is pretty small. I think you guys have a pretty good perspective on this being in Vegas, you know, having this terrific group of passionate developers here in Vegas. 
um, you're going to be interacting with each other throughout your careers. And even if someone moves away or they change jobs or, or whatnot, like the gaming industry is just fundamentally small and familiar. And acknowledging that means <clears throat> saying that, you know, no one wants to pollute the, the well from which we both draw what we need, right? Um, no one wants to corrupt that relationship because you're going to have to interact with that person at some point in the future, uh, whether, whether big or small. So um, it's particularly true in, in uh, editorial leadership, I guess. You know, I've, I've been there for 11 years. You've got like Andy McNamara, the, the editor at Game Informer, who's been there, I think, for like 22. You've got folks like Jeff Keeley and Stephen Totillo. So people stick around. Um, and developing these relationships and, and protecting them, it's in both our interests. And, and by the way, I'm not trying to say that this is a one-way street. I mean, like, this rule applies to us completely as well. You know, we, that well is ours as well. We share it. So it's just really important that we have that mindset, I think. Um, <clears throat> so uh, perhaps in terms of what not to do uh, with regard to that relationship, uh, I, I wanted to share a couple examples here. I think you're maybe getting a sense of uh, my, uh, my feelings around Twitter and, and the discussion that happens on Twitter throughout this talk, which is fun. But uh, I, I do this not to single anybody out, but just to provide an example of the kind of rhetoric that exists, like surprisingly, right, between developers and the press. Um, so these are older tweets that I pulled out on the left side of the slide. Um, but here we have a really prominent person at a very successful studio with a really popular game, uh, I think saying some interesting characterization, having some interesting characterizations of the press. And I'm not sure this is to say that like, the press is at all in the business of holding grudges. It's it's not it's not like we're sitting in our Slack channel like wondering how we can you know get back at somebody or, or or something as ridiculous as that. You know, fundamentally, our job is to tell the truth and serve our readers, and that's what we're, what we're concerned with. But we're just human beings, and anybody who is this abrasive and this um, inappropriate and, and sort of like you know trying to score points on social media, like of, of course that like you feel that. Um, but in particular, as you see at the bottom of the slide, when the person later invites journalists to check out their game at E3, you know, it, it just sort of like raises some questions about what their priorities are and how they hope to achieve that. <clears throat> okay, so again, I, I promise my intention is not to signal out anybody uh, in this talk, but I, I wanted to include this because it was something that we were actually editing and dealing with actively yesterday. This is a story that we published yesterday. Uh, well, not this one, but the one I'm, I'm about to show. <laughs> um, it, it's just fresh in my mind. We were literally dealing with it last night while I was here in Las Vegas. Um, so Mordhau is a really exciting game. It's actually like probably the second most played game for me this year. It's a terrific first person multiplayer medieval combat game from a cool independent team. Um, and this story, which was published a little less than two weeks ago, um, was all about its success. You know, it sold hundreds of, hundreds of thousands of copies. It, it emerged as like a community project in the shadow of a game called Chivalry, which is another medieval combat game. And yeah, what an exciting story. You know, this, this team, this inspiring team, and it's something that happens all the time on PC. I mean, the story of Battle Royale is a modder coming up with it and building it in the Arma engine, and now it's the biggest thing in the world. So of course we're interested in this story, you know. A small, scrappy team building a really exciting game in Unreal Engine. It's successful, it's fun, we like it. Uh, but yesterday we published this, which is a deeper examination of that game's community, the toxicity that now surrounds it from our, not only our perspective, but the perspective of many people in the community, uh, and what's happening to that audience. Um, so I don't want to spend this talk reading an article I do want to provide enough background here to sort of give you like what is like a very live, essentially, example that we were just dealing with. Um, but from our perspective, right, toxicity is it's what we consider a, a beat at PC Gamer. So if you if you read a newspaper, or, or if you if you if you're kind of broadly familiar with journalism, right, the way organizations are set up is that we assign beats to writers. We, we determine the topics and games, in this case, that we feel are important for a period. Um, right now, Toxicity is one of them. Uh, Apex Legends, as I mentioned a couple times, Overwatch, World of Warcraft Classic. You know, I can rattle them off. And we allocate people to cover them 
with a specific focus because over that time they become specialists and become really good at covering them. Um, so of course toxicity is important to us. Like we've seen a number of developers come out with different ideas around how to handle toxicity. It's just kind of a, a blooming problem in these skyscraper games again. Um, so you're asking yourself, right, like, what happened here? Well, I mean, really what we're doing is we're just covering the community. You know, we're not, we're not doing anything other than reporting the facts of what the community is saying about the game. And we extended that by interviewing the developers themselves. And what we ended up with last night was um, after we published the story and we interviewed the developers in Mordhau about their approach to toxicity and, and how they're handling it, uh, with regard to a, a couple different mechanics in the game, they later came out and, and essentially said that we got something wrong in our interview, uh, which is like a really rare instance. It's really rare for a developer to, on Twitter, publicly call a media outlet out for getting something wrong without first coming to us and sort of talking through it, right? So this is like a really uh, kind of interesting exercise for us last night. So to kind of dig into some of the details of, um, <clears throat> of what was discussed here. Let me back up one second here. Um, so the way we wrote it uh, in, this, in this story on the right was we described a growing toxicity problem that sees racist, sexist, and homophobic slurs thrown around both in the in-game chat and the official forums seemingly without repercussions. So it was clear to us that Mordhaus developers, and literally we we're talking with them and confronting them about this, were unprepared because they were a newer team that were, you know, massively successful game that were kind of unprepared and unwilling to meet the problem head on and take it seriously. So for example, there was no way to report players in Mordhaus. So if you played a multiplayer game like Overwatch in, in CSGO, for example, you're familiar with these reporting tools where you can basically, you know, tattletale on somebody who's griefing, literally cheating, or, or using, you know, racist or homophobic language, for example. It kind of depends on the game, of course. Um, in order to report somebody in Mordhau, you had to screenshot kind of an example of what happened and then take it in their Discord server and just kind of hope for the best. They also have kind of a lack of moderators to even operate this in general. So, so again, we interviewed them and, and talked about this as an issue. And one of the things that we talked with them about was this related issue where, you know, right now Mordhau only features uh, men as playable characters. And they'd previously kind of talked with their community about the plan to include women as playable characters. Um, and related to that, you know, you can also, within the character customization menu of Mordhau, you can only build characters that are essentially white in their skin color. And they've also been talking about this with their community and there have been like some interesting discussion about it. We wanted to bring it up because again, it, would be, it had been like a community topic. Um, so their, their response when we, when we spoke to them was to say that they may include this option for um, different skin colors for characters and also non-male characters as playable characters in game. But they're also considering an option to allow players to dis disable the appearance of women and white characters or non-white characters in the game as what they consider like a valid complaint from some of their community that this is a historical medieval combat game so if you know those players didn't want to see women, they shouldn't have to. They should be able to press a button and essentially erase women playable characters and, and, and the the you know them from being visible in their gameplay experience, which is just tremendously interesting to us, right? Just fundamentally, without passing any judgment on that, uh, that's something that hasn't happened before. Of course, we're going to cover that and dig into that and want to know like what's the thought process beyond that, right? So it was interesting to hear them say after we literally had them discuss this as a feature that essentially on Twitter, like, oh, that didn't happen. You know, anyone who's saying this, um, so they're, they're directly contradicting what we published. So this led us to essentially defend ourselves because, you know, it's, it's on us to represent what we perceive as the truth and what we verified. So as they come out and say, no, you know, anybody who's, who's saying this, that, you know, we, we plan a feature to disable, um, you know, non-white characters or, or women from the game, that's not true. We, we published then a longer version of our quote that provided context. And it actually led to us digging up more information um, that, that didn't um, really support their side of the argument. 
We found this quote from April on Steam, on the, on the official Steam forums for the game, where a developer for the game says, we're still looking into adding female characters post-release, as, as was promised. The realism complaint is valid, so when we add them, we might add a simple client-side toggle for both female and male characters, which would let you disable them. So right there, we've got them a few months ago saying the exact thing that they're saying on Twitter that they're not saying. Uh, and that's really because they contradicted us and, and they, they believe that we didn't get it right. <clears throat> uh, so following that, sh this continues on, right? It's, it's sort of a, an, an interesting little saga. So following that exchange this morning, uh, they gave this quote at the top of the slide to Polygon, where they, I think they acknowledge um, that they want to be better in their communication, which was great to see. Um, but I just I want to highlight this because this sort of back and forth is so rare, and I'm sort of I want to say lucky that sounds really cynical, but like I'm glad that I can bring something so timely that just happened to this talk. Um, I don't what the, I don't know what the moral of the story is other than like don't say you're going to make whites like whites only a gameplay setting that players can toggle. I guess like don't do that because of course we're going to write about it. Um, don't do something so unexpected and absurd. Um, <laughs> I mean, so I, I do have some lessons, I guess some pieces of advice um, that hopefully extend to the rest of the development community. I think the first thing is just to contact us. You know, we're extraordinarily easy to reach. I was working at 8 p.m. and there were people working later in different time zones. On this specific issue, we were alive to it for hours. Um, our emails are in our Twitter bios, you know, et cetera, et cetera. It's, it's really easy to track us down. And I think it was surprising in this instance not to hear from a developer about something so serious. Um, you know, even for trivial, you know, what I would consider trivial um, mistakes or typos, like we expect to hear from developers and, and sort of get their encouragement um, and, and ask, you know, get their input. Uh, and we definitely value that. Um, I would also say that, you know, it helps to have a PR person in instances like these. <laughs> Hopefully that goes without saying. There's actually like a really amazing set of people in the industry right now that have tons of experience helping independent developers. Um, whether you're working on a really long time scale or you just want to focus on a, a launch, um, there's really terrific agencies out there. So I think that this, the, the level of skill and um, just the variety of, of kind of different treatment you can get based on the specific game that you're creating is really fantastic. And, and you, you'd be fortunate to take advantage of that. Um, but, but maybe the biggest point here is just to confront the issue yourselves. You know, if, if you're aware of a sensitive topic around your game, uh, whether it's thematically or mechanically or, you know, having to do with the subject matter, um, that's an opportunity to shape the story. That's an opportunity to, to say that you're taking it seriously or, or just that you have a plan or, or a set of ideas around it rather than sort of floundering through it and, and contradicting yourself because someone else on the team said something else at one point. Um, a great example of that is Ubisoft. I love this image. I love this image that Ubisoft created for Rainbow Six Siege. Dev blog toxicity update. I think it's hilarious um, that they're <laughs> that they're basically acknowledging, like you know, it's almost unimaginable to think like five or ten years ago, and developers saying openly that they have issues with their community. They're just acknowledging the truth and and, and that they're trying to figure it out. Things aren't perfect, you know. How do we handle, you know, people using, um, <clears throat> you know, racist language in chat? Uh, do we filter it out? Do we block it out? Do we just give that as a tool to the players themselves to manage? Right? Like, these are really interesting questions. And Ubisoft got huge amounts of positive coverage, not because like they did anything super spectacular or unexpected, but just because like they addressed it, they talked about it, they talked about what was happening in reality, and they just sort of existed as human beings, right? But a lot of the press really latched on to that. And I'm like, every time I see these guys, I want to hear like what's next for these features and kind of what their thinking is because they seem like one of the pioneers now in, in this space in multiplayer shooters. Um, I guess the final thing here is, is just acknowledging that it's not a race. You shouldn't be in a hurry to, to get out some sort of contrary comment um, just to, to try and control the narrative. Uh, often that's going to have uh, more negative impacts. So thinking individually, right, like perhaps that example leaves, leaves with the question of how do I, you know, a thoughtful and cultured game developer, avoid unfavorable coverage in the media. 
So to that, I kind of provide an indirect answer. Um, our number one job is just to report the truth. Um, and to us, the truth consists of variable, verifiable facts, but also consists of the truth of our lived experience and our experience playing games, right? Um, and yes, this means that game reviews are subjective, not objective. <laughs> um, but fundamentally, I think acknowledging that the goals of the press are not the same goals as developers. And that sounds really obvious, but like think carefully about that, that you know, we're here to serve our audiences and purely to provide them with information that's relevant, interesting, and timely, and that matters to them. So if you happen to generate facts that are interesting, relevant, timely, et cetera, et cetera, like we're gonna latch onto that. Um, and there's only so much you can do to control the truth of your game, especially you know, thinking back to that diagram of everyone being a publisher, everyone kind of shaping the narrative together of what a game is, and, and the developers and publishers not having true and total control of that, um, of course there's gonna be a certain amount of facts that you, know, you don't completely own, that the community shapes themselves and they're out of, out of your hands. That's just kind of the, the landscape as it exists in 2019. Uh, and finally, you know, one of the best ways to avoid unfavorable coverage is something I mentioned earlier, which is just to find the people in gaming who are the best evangelists for your, your genre, your mechanics, the type of game that you're building. That's where you're gonna have great success in finding an advocate for the type of ideas that you're pursuing as a developer. So you do have some great tools at your disposal in, your, in navigating this relationship with the press. Um, the simplest thing is that you can follow up with us to add clarity about a mistake that we've made or you know, an extra detail that you like to tack on to something that we published. That's, you know, it's the internet, we can edit it, work with us, um, get in touch with us. You know, kind of the next level of that is a request a correction. If you feel like we've legitimately failed to deliver the truth, right? This is where you're reaching out to say, hey, you know, I think you've got something wrong here. It's never taken personally. It's never taken as a hostile act. Um, we care intensely about getting it right. And it's never gonna be received poorly if, um, if you reach out to us about that. And it's on us to own up to it, publish the correction, make it super clear, you know, reach out to other press who have maybe t um, piggybacked on, the on, on our story, make sure that they have it updated. So we're definitely participants in that process. Um, <clears throat> the nuclear option of that uh, spectrum, I guess, and it is something uh, to be clear that is not, some, not a power that we would ever allow a developer to have, but it, that would be a full retraction of a story. So I have trouble thinking of, of times where I've retracted a story at PC Gamer in 10 years. I, I can think of one, and that was a really specific legal circumstance. And that's almost always I think where I see our peers going. So to be clear, like expecting a, a retraction because you're unhappy with it, certainly not. Um, but even even in the in the instance of getting something wrong, we would much rather have the record exists of us getting it wrong than to like pull something that's even embarrassing to us. Like we want to wear that on our sleeves because again, that represents the truth. The truth is we screwed up. So we're going to leave it there, wear it, absorb that feedback, and move on. In interviews, um, it's worth noting kind of the, the different types of comments and, and the particulars of what off the record means versus on the record. So on the record is we own that information. We can go live with it immediately. So if, if, you're, if you're being told that you're being recorded, the expectation is you're on the record. Um, likewise, if, you, if you're giving us information via email, unless specified specifically, all that information is on the record. All that is accessible to us. So it's, it's, it's definitely incumbent on the source to outline which information is sort of fitting into which categories and which, which kind of buckets to us. Um, so off the record, is it's really simple. It's the complete opposite. It cannot be used under publication in any circumstance. There is, you know, a lot of trust has to exist there, um, depending on the type of information that's being shared. But if you're working like an, with an organization like us, um, I can't think of any of my peers you know, that I know of that has any kind of instance of sharing off the record information on their own website. Uh, it would, again, getting back to the well, it would be foolish to do that. You know, you're gonna work with that person again. Um, 
we're much more interested in cultivating what's called like on background information or anonymous information. Um, so that's the kind of stuff that's publishable but has certain kind of strings attached to it. So it might be, you know, if you read the Washington Post or the New York Times, you might read a story about like a White House advisor or a former aide or something along that lines, right? So there's some amount of detail in terms of where this information came from because fundamentally, in order for it to be supported and believable and feel substantial, like we have to be able to point to, well, what's the relevance? You can't just say a random person told us that Diablo 4 is coming out next month. Like no one's gonna, you know, that doesn't work for the reader. Um, but if we're able to say, well, an ex-Blizzard PR person we probably wouldn't go that specific, um, right? Like that has value, but it still protects the source. That's kind of the relationship of trust that exists within those types of interviews. Embargoes, you can tell us when we can publish something, if the information is given in advance, and if it's not like a live game, if, if we're sort of seeing a private demo at E3, often we'll get these embargoes to go live like once the E3 show floor opens up on Tuesday. That's really standard practice. It's great for everybody because it means that nobody's rushing uh, to try and beat each other, right? So say you invite 10 members of the press to check out your new game, you spent three years building it, um, they play it for, for six hours, right? And if you have no embargo, gosh, like I'm, I'm trying to like get out the door and get the fastest story I can up and that serves nobody. That's not, you know, that's not gonna protect the integrity of the story. So embargoes are actually really useful. We do see them broken a lot, uh, mostly because our, our content management systems fail us or somebody types in the wrong time zone or whatever. Um, but this is a really useful and, and just kind of like regular tool. There's tips, emails that you can use to reach out to us anonymously. Signal.org, if you go there, is a really great um, encrypted communication tool uh, for talking with members of the press if you're nervous about that. And then there's just the ancient art of the telephone, the lost art of actually calling somebody and uh, telling us what's going on. So I want to share a few more don'ts, kind of the other side of the coin. Um, I've arranged these from, from least offensive to video game crime, I guess. Um, as a member of the press, like we never really enjoy receiving information that's irrelevant to us, but we're just kind of used to it. It's part of the job. Um, but again, the, the, one of the best things you can do is figure out, okay, who's the news writer for PC Gamer? Who, oh, who's the news writer in the UK on those hours? If, if that's the time zone I'm operating and I have an update, right? Who's the guy who specifically loves and covers indie games? This stuff is really easy to find. Like, so we have like, a tagging system on our website. This is true of basically every gaming website. It's super easy to sort of get a landscape of who's doing what. And beyond that, like, we'll just tell you. You know, like if you're wondering, like, hey, one, like a one sentence email, who who loves um, you know turn based strategy games at PC Gamer? I'm happy to tell you. <clears throat> um, something that's like surprisingly frequent is just the the abundance and, and ubiquity of bad screenshots in games, or at least screenshots that kind of don't achieve our goals, which is they're easily decodable at thumbnail size. Okay, so if, if you think about, again, going back to platforms and how powerful they are, the majority of our audience is gonna be, their first impression of a game is gonna be a headline and an image. And that image has to convey a lot. It has to be decodable in, in the, I don't know, how many fractions of a second does it take for you to scroll through a feed and, and see some, something flittering by that you should care about, right? Um, so the bigger your library can be of character art, key art, forward-facing characters, doing action poses, all that kind of stuff, I love it. Um, the, the less like abstract and hard to read, the, the more successful the story's gonna be fundamentally, the more people are gonna read about your game. Um, I don't wanna go through all of these. Hopefully most of them make sense. Um, one of the huge no-nos is to ask to read a story before a publication, but it's it's like surprisingly common for people who are maybe new to interacting with the media. You don't request that. Like we're, we're never giving up the editorial control under any circumstance. That's inviting you into our kitchen, you know, like, and, it, and it's really a breach of the trust that we have with our reader, which is sacred, which is our opinions aren't influenced by a developer, you know, whatever, you know, part of the reason, and I haven't spent a lot of this talk and this presentation digging into like the ad, ad and um, sales relationship and editorial relationship within our companies, um, but we essentially have a church and state relationship with the, between the people that operate the ads on our website, which I have nothing to do with, and the people that auto, 
operate and cultivate the audience, which I have everything to do with. And that's super deliberate and intentional, and it's like the way things have been for decades. Um, so that re that would represent a breach of that. That would upset us. <laughs> um, Twitter, don't take your grievances there. Just talk to us. Like, you can do, go on a podcast together if you want, if you want to rant about your grievances. That sounds good. Um, so I want to spend a, a couple moments digging into just how a story is born um, at on our path to talking about how we make decisions around editorially. Um, so a story starts with a number of different sources, um, whether it's just something that we're personally passionate about or a developer approaches us with information, hey, our game's coming out next week, here's some assets, oh cool, great. Um, so from there, we're, we're vetting the story, we're judging whether it's worth our audience's time, whether we're personally interested in it, because every kind of gaming media organization brings their own kind of preferences and you know, what they care about as gamers to the process necessarily. And then we're also looking at analytics and tools to help us determine, well, how many people have, have been reading about Rocket League lately? Is Rocket League growing or is it flat? Is it shrinking? You know, we have, I think like you, as you're, as you're doing business development research, we have access to the same, you know, Steam charts, Steam DB, and PC in particular, it's like a really rich trove of tools because it's such a more open platform. So we can tell month over month how these games are doing in terms of their concurrent players, which is immensely useful. Um, so we're asking questions, and we're starting to compose the story. We write the story, it gets edited. Um, if it's a sensitive topic, we'll have our legal team look at it before publication and get their sign off to make sure we're not committing any lacks of libel. Um, and from there, we're publishing the story. We're figuring out what it looks like, what images should be paired with it. Um, do we take our own screenshots? Do we go in game and like use a replay tool? that exists in some games like Fortnite, uh, <clears throat> or do we kind of use what the developers provided and um, you know, the best way to present the story? And then through updating, the story continues on, right? So um, as new information comes available, we're gonna make sure it's relevant and added to the story if that's the nature of things. So what gets coverage? Um, what determines what ends up on a website like mine and my peers? To me, and again, like, I think a lot of my colleagues will probably contradict me on, on these details, but for me, it's an intersection of what we're interested in personally as gamers, right? Kind of the, the values that a game presents, uh, what's happening with a genre, and is the game building on a genre? Is it uh, kind of more the same? It's also an intersection of what our audience is interested in, of course, in the ways I've described, uh, both through analytics and, and kind of just what they're telling us qualitatively through the comments and elsewhere. And it's an intersection of what's new and what, what performs, right? So we know that on PC Gamer, people love reading about classic RPGs like Baldur's Gate. Just part of our audience, you know, we've been around for 25 years. We've got kind of a core of people who really care about those games, who just are huge fans. So we're a little bit more biased towards that type of game, right? We know it performs well for us. A um, couple of things that are attention getters. Is your game headlinable? So probably the most successful press releases I receive are ones that demonstrate that they're already thinking about how to headline their game or the story that they're presenting. In some cases, they're, they're trying to give us like a ready-made headline. Um, they're, they're just really thinking about it in those terms, not presenting information or like a, you know, a matter of fact uh, fashion. They're, they're like actively using our voice, the voice of gaming media, in their presentation, what ends up in the subject line of our inbox, which is really clever. Um, <clears throat> stories that are actionable, we're certainly biased towards, so, okay, this game exists, but can you download it yet? Can you buy it yet? Um, can you watch a trailer yet? You know what I mean? Um, so the more actionable elements there are there, the, the more substantial the story starts to feel. And, you know, again, getting back to the audience shaping the narrative, uh, being a source of stories, does the game have a vibrant community? So if you've operated a Kickstarter, um, if you're you know, on itch.io, what does it look like there? You know, are people talking about the game? Are people already modding the game? You know, what, what's happening there? Does it kind of represent um, a healthy looking thing to pursue for us? <clears throat> uh, I guess getting back to, I just wanted to mention a few of the, what I, what I see like the pain points in terms of like direct communication with press. Um, it's, it's surprisingly hard to get 
terrific press kits and, and track those down. You know, on, on develop a website, I understand that there's a lot of priorities in terms of presenting your game. Um, but you'll want to make those assets as available as possible, especially in the age where people are building YouTube thumbnails about your games. Um, you want to have amazing imagery that is, you know, as wide as possible, as representative of the game as possible, but fundamentally like flexible and exciting, and that can exist on many different platforms naturally. Um, you know, it, it sounds like really lame, but games with difficult names are challenging for us. Like fundamentally tweets and headlines and like, you know, we don't want to just publish like a six line headline that looks ridiculous. It like breaks the kind of template of our website. So Vampire the Masquerade Bloodlines 2, for example, with like two pieces of punctuation in it. We're really excited about that game, but like we kind of end up just calling it Bloodlines 2, um, which is fine. That works for us, but you know, there's other examples here. Um, so this is kind of an example of something I heard one of the developers of uh, Ooblets. Um, I forget his last name. His first name is Ben. But, but you know, one of the interesting ideas that he put forth on his own development blog a year or two ago was just the thought that a lot of developers, not just indies, but, but people who approach the industry in general, they think that their job is to make a game and like figure out how to market marketed at the end of that sentence, you know, at the end of the line. Like build a game and then figure out, well, how do I sell this to people? How do I get the press to pay attention to it? And really, I think you should be asking yourselves throughout the process and at the very beginning of the process, am I making a marketable game at all to the press? Am I building my game in such a way that is shareable, and that lends itself to like fun animated GIFs that are gonna work on these platforms that again are sit at the center of all information in gaming? Um, fundamentally, Thinking about those things hand in hand rather than sort of an assembly line of different tasks, I think really sets developers up for success. Uh, we don't like interview restrictions. That's pretty obvious. So telling us like we're only going to talk about this today, um, I'm less likely to agree agree to that. Um, yeah, we talked about press releases too. So reaching the end here. Hopefully, what I'm equipping you guys to take away here today is that the gaming press is as diverse as it's ever been in terms of the makeups of our organization, in terms of the types of stories that we're pursuing, um, how challenging those stories are for us and our audience in some cases. I think that's really exciting. Um, it's something to celebrate. Online media is volatile. We're subject to that. New York Times is subject to that. We're all kind of living in that atmosphere, trying to get our messages out there in an ever-shifting landscape. Don't pollute the well that exists that we both benefit from, uh, that we both have to, have to draw what we need from, which is audience. Um, audience behavior in 2019 shapes the coverage that we create fundamentally. It's not where all of our stories come from, but it's a hugely influential part. And you do well by cultivating a, a, an excellent community for your game, a vibrant community that looks good upon you, you know, reflects the values that you're presenting in your game, because that's highly visible to us. And, and to some extent, they're the ones carrying a lot of that narrative forward. And the best practices are actually really simple. You know, like I think the stuff that I presented here in terms of offering us great imagery, making it accessible, making it easy to find you, emailing us, calling us, like th these are really obvious steps, but they get ignored more frequently than you think. Um, so there's no rocket science. It's not a mystery. Um, we're accessible. We care about the truth. And um, some simple steps can really set you up for success. All right, so I'm happy to turn the tables and, and kind of be the interviewee for once, and thanks for listening to my talk. Thank you so much, Evan. That was absolutely wonderful. Uh, we have two microphones to pass around. Uh, raise your hand if you have any questions. Like this. <laughs> uh, thanks again for coming out, Evan. Um, my question for you was, who do you, because I know you talked earlier about how before in, you know, 1990s to about 2010, it was really the developers talking to the media and then you guys, you know, talking to the public that really got the cycle going, but now it's just kind of like everyone. Would you say there's still like a top dog, quote unquote, in terms of how game information gets released, how public opinion on a game gets 
know, changed over time, et cetera, et cetera. So in terms of like a developer who's doing it really well? More, more in the vein of like, uh, do you think there is like a, a top dog in, of the games media between you, influencers, the audience that can be effectively, you know, media people themselves by publishing content, that kind of stuff? I'm not sure. I mean, it depends so much on the type of game that you're building and the type of work that you're doing. Um, so, you know, I, I can point to a bunch of different streamers who are extraordinarily good at like XCOM. And that's like all they do. And if you're building that type of game, like they're going to be interested in that. They're going to showcase that their audiences. And that might be sort of like your tip of the spear because you're going to catch on to that. It's going to grow your community like strategically, right? I, I think there, there's no there's no one there's no universal path, right, to to sort of getting heard. It's it's so contingent because there's so much specialization um, on the type of game that you're building. I think um, I, I can say like definitely in kind of what I'm describing there. Like there is a, some interesting gray area between what what I was describing as the community, which is you know you might consider like the subreddit for your game or you know the people on uh, itch.io or in the comment sections or in your own personal forums. Um, but it's also like the streamers who care about your stuff. Like they kind of represent an extension of that community. And we listen to them as well. You know, we're, we're paying attention to them, we're following them. Um, we're, we have access to the Twitch concurrency numbers and kind of what people are playing right now. So like team fight tactics and the like growing genre of auto chess is something we're paying a lot of attention to right now. But um, it's hard to identify like a, a universal path. Um, but again, I guess I'd say generally like acknowledging the differences between the different outlets and sort of starting to think about like who, who within those outlets like is going to be a good advocate for me in the type of game that I'm building, who's going to be like curious and, and enthusiastic about my particular project. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so I wrote some questions down, but a lot of these you answered. <laughs> um, nice. <laughs> Why do you think that there is, I know that there's a direct comp, uh, connection between the developer and their audience now with, with Twitter and that sort of thing. Why do you think um, there is this, this want for them to discredit you before coming to you about an article that may have some misinformation or what they see and perceive as misinformation? And on the op that another side of that question is, um, if you're a PR person and you're trying to explain to your company like that it's a good idea to keep the wrong information on the internet, like how what would you suggest as a way to kind of um, make them feel okay about that? Like like you know like what 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 direction would you push them? I guess or point them in. Sure. I'll take the latter part first, I guess. Um, so for us, right, like, there needs to be a record. And I, I guess, like, the argument is, right, like, the internet doesn't forget. Maybe you've heard that phrase. People screenshot stuff. And, and yes, there's an element of, like, we don't want to make it appear as if we're hiding a mistake by rarely retracting a story, right? But um, it, it, it's just an extension of our job. Like, we, we want to show the chronology of what happened to a story. And, and it sort of represents its own like little history, even if it's flawed and even if there's errors. And by, there, there's just, to us, there's, like, there's a sacredness in doing that. So from a PR perspective, I mean, it means, to me, it adds more confusion if people go to that URL and it 404s. You know, it adds more confusion if um, they're like having to track down like on Twitter discussions or elsewhere, like what actually happened here. Um, cause that's, that's what that results in. If, if we pull down a story, it's, it's dead. Like the link no longer works. Um, I'm sorry. Can you repeat the first part of your question too? Yeah. Sorry. That's okay. No, I was, I was wondering what, what you think causes, uh, companies to, instead of coming to you about an issue, just going straight directly to their communities. Do you think it's hashtag fake news? <laughs> no, I, I mean, I think they're, they're probably seeing a lot of the conversation happen on Twitter, so they think that by, by going to a place like Twitter, they're addressing it. That's where the fire is being fought. Um, and, and certainly there's an element to that, but it, it, it's not a good practice to, like we're, we're partners in the truth, hopefully. That's hopefully, like, that's what I aspire to with my relationship, relationships with developers. And if 
you, you know, if, if you believe we've screwed up, if you believe that we got a fact wrong, however big or small, and you're not sharing that with me, and you're expecting me to like find that out through my own kind of discovery and research, fundamentally, like you're not setting me up for success, you're not letting me do my job. Um, so I don't know, it's, it's hard for me to like psychoanalyze, but, but I think like certainly just in the, like the global media climate, there's a, there's a sense that like, oh, if I say something on Twitter, it exists, that's the truth, that's where statements are made, right? I think that's, I mean, that's like fair in terms of like how people behave right now, but it, it's not the be all end all. Yeah, thanks. All right, I'll take the next question. Thanks. Um, so I was curious about a Kickstarter review. So let's say that I had a Kickstarter in prototype <clears throat> mode, right? Draft mode, and I was interested in getting some feedback on it. Okay. At, at this point, would it be okay for me to, I mean, in your personal opinion, should I be asking the press to review a draft Kickstarter before I took it live? So, <clears throat> so fundamentally, um, I'm not sure if this is exact, exactly what you mean. The press are not consultants, right? There's, a, there's definitely a whole category of, in, in many cases, people who used to work in the press who are like paid consultants, um, people who I would say like work in marketing that, can, that would provide you with that information. But if, you're, if, if what you're saying is, I'm about to launch my Kickstarter and I want to expose you to that information so you can prepare a story, like we're absolutely interested in that information, right? Um, and as long as you, you have something that's substantial, you have assets, you know what the game is, you can give us those basic details. Um, like, of course, we want to hear that information in advance um, so we can prepare and be ready for the launch of your Kickstarter. An interesting detail here too, like through our analytics, we know that putting Kickstarter in a headline is a bad idea, which is interesting. Um, so we'll actually go out of our way, not to bury the fact that the game is being crowdfunded, like we'll absolutely mention that in the story, but we know that putting it in the headline more often than not makes people go away or, or not click on the story. Um, so sometimes we'll use things like, you know, and there's even other examples. You know, I talked about like problematic game names. If we really are interested in the game, but the game name is like hard to decode, it's maybe like an acronym people have never heard about before. It's like, it's got like two colons in it, like the Warhammer games. There's 20 of them who can tell them apart. Um, We'll, we'll just sort of say like, we'll, we'll generalize it and say like, this game is XCOM meets, um, you know, Stardew Valley. And people grasp that, you know, like we go for the more general accessible concept and then like once they're there, then they can get that like raw information. So I don't know, help, help me answer that more clearly though. Did I attack that? I think that was um, a good explanation for probably more than what I was asking for. I was really just asking for some consulting. Totally. Right? So, and you kind of answered that pretty quickly by saying no, thank you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so to, be, so to be clear, right, like we, we don't, it's not our job to help developers market their games, period. Um, we're, <laughs> we're, we're interested in our audiences, and if we, if we think your game is relevant to our audience, we're happy to consider it for publication, basically. But fundamentally, like, we're not gonna give you feedback on your trailer, we're not gonna tell you if your screenshots, or, I mean, not in that manner, not with an eye toward helping you sell. I mean, that would be essentially a breach of the kind of editorial trust uh, that our readers rely on us for. Because then if we go and cover that game, well, it's like, well, we were like partners in launching it, right? Um, so that, like that idea. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Question, yeah. how much, how often, or how much bad blood do you think occurs when there's differences between when you want to release something and the developer or production company if something wants released, and how much would you say that impacts the poisoning of the well? I'm sorry, can you get the first part of that again? How much bad blood is there? Yeah. Between when a developer wants information released and when you want to release information. Oh, I see. Um, <clears throat> I think, um, so again, I'm gonna, I'm gonna just keep repeating myself. We're always thinking about our audience and what they care about. So we know through our powerful analytics tools, when people are going to be reading our site most frequently in hours of the day. So like 8 a.m., 9 a.m. Pacific. Um, so if we think your story is super exciting, that's probably the time that we're going to target. Um, if we, if we you know, have a similar a story about like a similar type of game, we might create some space between them. You know what I mean? Like we're not going to publish 
if it's our choice, like two blockbuster game reviews at the same moment, because they kind of cannibalize each other, we want to draw attention to one thing and give it its own time in the spotlight, algorithmically and otherwise. To answer your question more directly, like there isn't a lot of tension there. Uh, embar embargoes are usually pretty standard. Like most developers are aware of those times already. So like professional PR, they're going to say, well, please publish your story at like between 6 and 9 a.m. Pacific um, on a weekday because they're familiar with when, where, where audiences are. That's where they want to be. We agree to it typically uh, with, without any changes and it's fine. <clears throat> Pass the baton. Cool, thanks oh. guys. Editorial, I can understand where you want to uh, report, uh, report, report and observe. I can also see an element of leadership in the community. How do you view that for your, your, your job? Do, do you guys provide, like, do you look at things and say, not only are you observing and reporting out at, uh, without bias, but do you see yourself in some respects trying to be a leader in the community? And I'm asking. That's really good. Um, I mean, this taps into, like, <laughs> really relevant recent discussions about the role of the press among like certain members of the gaming community. So one element of it that's really specific to our publication is we're called PC Gamer, which is itself an identity within the gaming community. So to us, like more than I think Polygon, more than Kotaku, um, and this isn't a slight for those guys, this is the position we're in, we're evangelists for our own platform. Like you're not gonna say that Kotaku or Eurogamer is an evangelist for Nintendo, right? That feels wrong. That's a that's a brand. Whereas we're focused on the values and ideals of the gaming platform that we, we represent, which are like openness, right? Um, you know, anti-DRM, um, many stores and competition. PC is political stores. correctness, right? I'm sorry. PC is political correctness, right? <laughs> that's that's another way of putting it. Um, but in terms of like the, the broader leadership question. I mean, this is like an this is something that we grapple with, right? Um, we have values as writers, as people, and as gamers that we care about, and we we definitely don't restrict ourselves from bringing those values to the page. Now, I think there's there's a certain limit to like the things that we advocate for. Um, I have a hard time like drawing those lines in more specific terms, but like. Broadly, yes, you know, like we, we want to stand up for the things that we care about and believe in. So, you know, Larry mentioned at the outset of this talk, of course, as gamers and as people in the industry, like we have a perspective on crunch. Like, of course we do. And we're going to bring that to our coverage necessarily. It's not to say that like at every opportunity we're going to hit people over the head and, and punish, somehow punish uh, game developers with, or publishers, I think in particular, with kind of what's happening there. But, but it plays out in, in what we decide to cover and, and how we frame that issue, right? Um, and where we pursue it. So th that's maybe one example of it, you know, identifying the issues that we care about. Crunch, toxicity is another really good one. Um, the, the cheating industry, um, maybe another example of that as, as leadership is like, uh, if <clears throat> I see in our website that we're, we're advertising so like uh, G2A, right? Like that's that's a, a game resale website. It's like essentially a gray market for selling game keys that developers do not profit from whatsoever. There's a, there's a really current discussion on, of this on Twitter between a lot of prominent in, independent developers where they're saying, instead of buying our game on G2A.com, you should just pirate it. Um, so that's the sort of stuff where like, of course we have a stake in and like occasionally like those sort of websites will appear in our advertising. We'll have to say like, no, like you have to, Get, get rid of that on our sales team. So that's maybe, I don't know, more like behind the scenes example of leadership. Like we have to stand up for what we believe in, partly because it reflects on our brand, but because like we actually believe it. Um, and frankly, it'd be pretty boring if we were just asked to be objective all day long. Go to go to objectivegamereviews.com. It's a really fun uh, experiment. If you, if you want to actually read what an objective game review looks like, it's, it's not very fun. Um, there's been a controversy as of late with uh, digital distribution in games, namely um, Epic Game Store, right? And there's a, been a lot of articles on PC Gamer regarding games that are released that have Epic Game Store exclus exclusive, <clears throat> right? Yeah. Um, and a lot of the comments on PC Gamer are 
um, very anti anti Epic Game Store. Um, very right. like you know if I'm if it's not going on Steam, I'm not buying it at all. Totally. Uh, and and you just kind of building off of your um, conversation about being objective, right? Um, or not being objective. Uh, what is PC gamer stance on exclu uh, exclusive platforms such as the Epic Game Store or Discord or things like that? Terrific. I mean, this is a uh, yeah, this is the front of our, our minds every day. It seems like there's kind of a new evolution. I, I guess the most recent example is uh, Epic said today that um, for Shenmue, which was a, the most Kickstarter game in history. Um, not the most crowdfunded, that's Star Citizen. But on Kickstarter in particular, they're going to be refunding the people who feel cheated, essentially, that they're not going to be playing the game on Steam, Shenmue 3. Um, <clears throat> so I really hate the way this sounds, because it, it sounds like exactly the sort of response that um, I'm advocating against in uh, talking about the way developers give interviews. But again, the press is not monolithic. Our organization is not monolithic either. So we have, we have a variety of opinions on this topic. We've, we, can, we published a story, I can pass it to you after this discussion, where different members of our team represent that in an article. There's a back and forth conversation about the pros and cons. And frankly, like, for me personally, I think it's something we're still grappling with. Across the board, I want to see competition in PC gaming. If you're asking me what the values of PC gaming are, it's openness, it's the power to choose. So. In a, in, a more, in a macro sense, that means more stores, you know, we're not a closed platform, we're not a walled garden like Xbox where there's one way to buy your games digitally, right? Um, from a consumer perspective, that's a great experience where you have Steam and Epic in theory duking it out, getting the best prices for you. And, and I agree that like the better revenue cut rates we can get for developers that opens up opportunities for more competitive pricing as well. So there's that advantage, but as you're digging into, as, as you're touching on there, right, like exclusivity is not something PC gamers are accustomed to. Uh, fundamentally, many many of our readers, as you're referencing there, think of it as something that that's happens on Xbox and PlayStation, where they you know <clears throat> they buy these studios, they own the rights to them, and if you want to play you know The Last of Us, you have to buy a PS4. Um, so I mean there. I don't know, there's, there's real, you, you can kind of see the paradox there between long-term, you know, if the PC and gaming community supports Epic generally, that probably plays out in a way that's favorable to everybody, um, except for Valve, except for Steam, um, because we have a more competitive landscape where Steam is not the absolute, or like, you know, de facto monopoly over digital distribution. But in the short term, it's very painful. And like, people are totally justified in being uncomfortable and raising questions because, you know, who wants to, like, yes, ultimately it's different, like exclusivity is different there because you're not having to buy a $400 piece of hardware to play that game, you're just having to install something different. So there's there's many different, um, there's a gap of in, in convenience there. Um, but I can understand, like, PC gamers want things streamlined as an experience. I don't want to have 10 things running on my PC. Like, it's not a great feeling. So as you can, it, hopefully, like, I can show that we're like we grapple with this um, in a way that I think is honest, and um, I guess I'd add to that like we don't see it, we don't see it, it as our job. Getting back to the leadership question, to pick winners, you know, it would it, it's not on us to say, well, you know, Epic is doing it right, so everybody go over here. Like we're not going to dictate that to people. Of course, you know, we want to allow for the truth of people's different experience on PC and what it means to them, what an exclusive means to them. So without being too wishy-washy, that's where we stand now. Thank you. Thanks. <clears throat> where do you I, I'm gonna kind of interrupt for a second. Oh, sorry. Just, yeah. uh, no, to just add, add that um, there's a, another factor to that, which is the discussion um, <clears throat> is how the media covers various platforms, but there's another side to it too. So there are these people that make games in the industry called developers. And um, I'm, I'm a big believer um, that they have a right to make a living. And so if uh, somebody's going to pay them more money over here than they get over there, I kind of think that's an OK thing. <clears throat> just wanted to add that and interject it just as, as another point of view. And 
I kind of respect PC Gamer for supporting that position also, so thank you for that. Um, one thing I'd also like to add about a, a, an answer to your earlier question, I don't know how many interviews we've done. Um, Wes, um, Andy Chalk, um, I've, done, I've done a number of interviews. Um, I, I would love to say that all the coverage I've ever gotten in my life has always been positive, and that would be far from the truth. Um, and, and this isn't just for PC Gamer, this is across the entire spectrum of media. Um, I've done a lot of interviews in, in my life. Um, one thing that has never, ever happened to me, I've never been misquoted. I've had interviews present, well, gee, I wish you had added that other sentence to it, but, you know, you didn't. Um, uh, but I have, I have never been wrongly quoted. And it goes back to the, the, uh, the, the earlier reference with, with Mordow. Um, if, if you don't want them to print something that you said, probably shouldn't have said it. Cool, thanks, Larry. So much like how in the, in the past few years we've seen a serious decline or almost like a death of print media, do you think at some point in the future there, there would be a similar death of like games media where instead of, you know, there's all these sites like PC Gamer, Kotaku, Vice Gaming, there, it becomes much more developers just reporting news straight to everyone and there's no real need for sites like PC Gamer and, and the such. It's on us to distinguish ourselves and remain valuable. Right, so what, we, what you're talking about has already happened. Um, so to get information, I keep bringing up Apex Legends, I'm sorry, it's just like, it's happening today. So like literally been dealing with it for the past couple of days. But like in order to get information about what's happening with Apex Legends, we go to their Reddit, we, we follow their community manager on Twitter, um, we go to their dev blog, right? We actually don't talk with them as much as you think about like, hey, what's coming next? And like, what's in the new update? Like, of course, like we're in conversation with them, but fundamentally like they push that information out and we receive it at roughly the same time everybody else does. So what you're talking about has kind of already happened. So if, if the gaming industry, if the gaming media was in danger in that way, um, it, it probably would have shown signs of happening to me. And, and certainly like, I have, I have a horse in this race, <laughs> but um, you know we just had our best week ever at E3. Um, we have 14, 14 million readers last month, which is the, you know one of our best performing months ever. Um, so just quantitatively doing really well. One of the bigger threats to us is just shifts in um, the way platforms operate. So Google holds an immense amount of power in how they present information and what, and what they value. So say, if Google cha changes their algorithm to, for example, value official sources, um, it's, it's somehow able to flag that. Um, suddenly, like all the searches for Diablo 4, for you know World of Warcraft, for Hearthstone to, to zero in on Blizzard, if those are all if those are all kind of catered toward Blizzard.net or Battle.net, um, and we're sort of like cut out of that equation that makes things really challenging for us because we rely on our ability to compete in that ecosystem, for example. So we're definitely vulnerable to those sorts of, you know, whimsical changes on platforms as much as anybody, but um, the, the sites that are succeeding right now, and there's a lot of different ways to succeed, as I hope I covered, they're doing so by producing crucial information that's, that's relevant, you know, by the power of the perspective that they bring by how they, by how they shape, you know, contextualize that information. Um, and, and hopefully the trust they build with that audience is hopefully more valuable than just the raw data of patch notes or screenshots or trailer, right? Um, to our benefit is the fact that there's a hell of a lot of video games right now and it's impossible for anybody to figure out like what's good, what's bad, what's up, upcoming, right? Like sorting through that takes it, like we have 17 full-time people and we don't cover everything, you know? like. There are teams that are three times that size at IGN and GameSpot, for example. They don't cover everything. Um, so the volume of, again, of, of information, games, and activity is, is so much bigger than um, kind of like the display space that we have, which I think works to our benefit there. We get to operate as a curator, coming back to one of my earlier points. 
All right, we're going to have to end it there. We are out of time. But again, thank you so much, Evan and PC Gamer, for coming. Uh, thank you to Innovation and Ryan and the AV department. Uh, thank you to Kevin and Tina at v uh, Next Gen VGC for providing the awesome food. And thank you to all of you for showing up tonight. Uh, this was really awesome. I appreciate it. Thank you.